Okay. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon um, on a sunny Friday. Uh, we really appreciate it and for being so patient with us um, in our technical difficulties today. Um, so my name is Brianne Schuster, and I am the voting rights researcher here at the ACLU of Washington. Um, I'm also an attorney here in the state. And as my title probably gives away, um, my work has primarily consisted of doing voting rights research um, and legal pertaining to legal issues um, related to voting rights. And one thing that we've really learned through this work and through this research is that a lot of people that have felony convictions are unsure whether, when, or how they get their voting rights back. And a lot of people actually think that they never will get those, um, their right to vote back. So the ACLU is actively engaging in outreach efforts right now to really spread this information about the law, share resources and information with people who have felony convictions, um, as well as individuals who work with people who have felony convictions. So in addition to the webinar today, we have a number of materials um, that if you haven't already received from us, we would be happy to send to you. And we, if you've already received them and want more, we definitely want to send you more, so just let us know. And we have also have an intake line, so people, if they have questions or concerns, um, you know, there's set up, that number is set up for them to call and get assistance or resources. Um, so today, we're going to spend probably about 35 to 40 minutes worth um, of material, and then I'm hoping to leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. We'll see kind of how many questions there are and how fast I can get through all the material. But if we don't get to cover everything today for whatever reason, you can definitely feel free to email or call me. I'll give you my contact information at the end of the presentation, um, and I'm happy to try to answer anything that we don't get to. Okay, so the first thing that I just kind of wanted to talk about today is really the history of disenfranchisement and its impact on communities. So when we talk about, um, you know, disenfranchisement, which is the focus of the webinar today, I think it's really helpful to kind of look at it in a big picture context. And look, you know, recognizing that disenfranchisement is just one type of restriction that limits access to the ballot for folks. So there's kind of two main categories when we talk about, um, you know, voting restrictions or voting limitations. And one is voter dilution, and that's really looking at an election system, right? So is everyone elected at large, or is it limited voting? Is it districted voting? How is that election system functioning to make sure that everyone has or doesn't have? Um, how is it, you know, impacting people's voices and ability to participate in the, in the election system? or in the electoral process. And this is also where we kind of talk about jurisdictional boundaries, right? How are jurisdictions drawn? How many people are in the jurisdiction? Where are the lines being made? And then we have voter suppression. And this tends to get a lot more kind of national coverage, I think partially because it's easier to understand how its impact um, is, you know, its, its impact is a little bit more obvious at times. and so. This is where felon disenfranchisement kind of comes in, but we're also looking at things like ID requirements, impediments to registration, purging voter polls, limiting hours that people can vote, et cetera. And so I think, you know, all of these laws are important to look at together because they really do work together in concert to restrict ballot access and the ability to really meaningfully participate in the electoral process. And I think it's also really apparent that a lot of these policies specifically, um, you know, intentionally or not, impact poor people and people of color. And I think this election is going to be really interesting to see as we're seeing these um, issues play out because it's the first election since um, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, which was the preclearance coverage formula. So essentially it struck down the preclearance requirement period and so we're kind of seeing that impact of that decision in this election right now, or in this presidential election. So unsurprisingly, um, the origins of felon disenfranchisement really do come from a place of racism. 
Um, as a concept, voting disenfranchisement has been along since, you know, America was born. Um, it, was, it came over with the English colonialists, and they brought the common law practice of civil death, which was basically a set of criminal penalties, including the revocation of all citizenship rights um, and thereby voting rights if you committed certain crimes. Disenfranchisement, though, as we know it today, really originated after the Civil War, and it was in response to Reconstruction and the 15th Amendment. Um, and so after the Civil War, we saw states, this is when states really began enacting laws that were targeted specifically at limiting black male access to the ballot. So by 1850, more than a third of states had felony disenfranchisement laws. And they were specifically tailored oftentimes to bar black male voters um, by targeting offenses that they thought, you know, the black community committed more frequently. So, for example, in Mississippi, their law is called for disenfranchisement of theft-related crimes, but if you commit a robbery or murder, you weren't um, subject to disenfranchisement. And the discriminatory intent of these laws was certainly not hidden or, you know, um, disguised in any way. So, in Virginia, for example, their um, senator, when they were talking about amending their constitution to incorporate a lifetime ban on voting for people with a felony conviction, they said that this plan was intended to essentially eliminate blacks as a political factor in the state. In Alabama, um, when they were trying to kind of rewrite their constitution, one of their um, you know, constitutional writers wrote that the, the goal of this convention and the goal of these amendments was really to establish white supremacy in the state. And so since the Civil War and since the Reconstruction era, we've seen felon and disenfranchisement continue to increase in popularity. And they really increase, uh, particularly in times when other methods of voter suppression are overruled or outlawed. So today, we have 95% of states, or 48 out of, 90 states, 48 out of 50 states, have disenfranchisement laws. And that's been the case since 2008. So, as you can imagine, these laws have a desperate um, impact on people of color. And they always have and they continue to today. So, today, nationally, one out of 13 black adults are unable to vote because of bond disenfranchisement laws. And in some states, as much as 20% of the population cannot vote because of felony conviction. Um, black adults are also four times more likely than white adults to be unable to vote because of these laws. In Washington, prior to the 2009 law, um, statistics were also pretty awful as far as disproportionality. So 17.22% of the Washington black voting age population were uneligible to vote because of these laws. And more than 10% of the Latino population was not able to vote. So today, we're seeing nearly 6 million Americans who cannot vote because of a felony conviction. And this is partially because, you know, the U.S. is the largest jailer in the world. Um, and this also then works in concert with the fact that the U.S. has the most severe disenfranchisement laws of any democracy. Um, so today, you know, it's really an outlier when we're looking at other countries and their disenfranchisement laws or lack thereof. So, for example, in Europe, about half of the countries make it possible to vote even while in prison. And in can countries like Canada, Israel, South Africa, etc., their courts have declared that restricting voting rights for individuals with felony conviction is actually illegal. So you're not able to impose any restrictions based on a criminal conviction in a number of countries. So even though, and we'll talk about this in a minute, um, in some states, you know, restrictions, the number of restrictions or the types of restrictions, and we've seen this in Washington too, have been eased um, slightly for people that have a felony conviction. That said, the disenfranchisement um, rates or number of people that have been disenfranchisement has actually increased. And again, we're seeing part of this is due to, um, you know, mass incarceration epidemic in this country. And part of it is due to incredibly harsh disenfranchisement laws in particular states. But in general, we've seen an increase of nearly 300,000 Americans just in the past decade who are disenfranchised. disenfranchised. 
And like I said, the total now um, rests at six, nearly six million. What I think is really interesting when we talk about disenfranchisement um, and, the, and the arguments you kind of hear about it is that the very vast majority of people that aren't not eligible to vote are actually not in jail or prison. They've been released in the community and are, you know, contributing members of society but are not able to vote. So three quarters of people who can't vote have completed a jail or prison sentence um, but are just either on some form of community supervision or live in a state that has permanently banned their ability to vote. And nearly half of people um, either have completed all of their requirements, um, whether it was prison, parole, or the other community requirements, or they never even spent time in jail at all. So these are people that really have, you know, paid their debts, but are not able to contribute or access the ballot. Thankfully, we have seen a lot of calls for change, and we've also seen a number of legal challenges to voting suppression efforts generally, as well as following disenfranchisement laws. So generally, you know, kind of looking at the big picture of voter suppression and methods of voter suppression, you know, we banned the poll tax in 1964, um, and we also, the Supreme Court decided the Reynolds v. Sims case, which ruled that legislative districts have to be roughly proportional in population. And we've, we have seen um, equal access or access to the ballot become more equal as a result of these decisions, and particularly because of the Voting Rights Act, which also happened in that era, uh, which prohibits discrimination in voting. Although we're seeing, you know, all of these concepts kind of be chipped away at as well. Um, we had the Evan Wall decision this year, which was challenging the definition of what one person, one vote was. We've seen Shelby v. Holder just a couple years ago challenging Section four of the Voting Rights Act and thereby Section 5. And I think, you know, there's arguments that Evan Well, um, you know, and we, I'm happy to talk more about this in a in different context with anyone who's interested, but was actually a backdoor attack on the Voting Rights Act as well. Um, but, you know, we have seen some, some good protections for folks and some developments that have been really positive. One in particular that's more recent was the Motor Voter Act. And a lot of people aren't aware of this, but this law actually requires state governments to offer voter registration opportunities to any eligible person who applies for or renews a driver's license or applies for or renews public assistance. And this led to actually the largest single increase of voters in U.S. history. So it's a pretty great law um, that, you know, many people don't know that you can register in those places. So that said, despite these advances and protections, as you know, we kind of mentioned that the ballot to vote is still taking place in nearly every state across the country. And we continue every year to see more and more restrictions attempt to be passed. Um, whether or not they are, we're seeing a lot of states really try to make additional restrictions on the, this access to the ballot. So we still have a long way to go in protecting the right to vote and protecting meaningful opportunities to participate in the political process. With regards to felony disenfranchisement specifically, there's been two sort of landmark cases. The first is Richardson v. Ramirez, and this one challenged the California Constitution that prohibited people from voting with felony convictions um, as violative of the Equal Protection Clause. And the U.S. Supreme Court, um, it was not that great of a decision, arguably, for, for people that believe people you know, everyone would want to vote, but it allowed, it essentially said that disenfranchisement was legal and was constitutional. Um, the next big case was in about 10 years later in Hunter v. Underwood, and this challenged disenfranchisement um, laws as, and the argument there was that these laws were intentionally, um, or were intended to discriminate against black men, or black adults. Um, and this court in that case actually did ultimately find that there was discrimination in the laws in that state. The unfortunate kind of outcome, however, of the decision was that now intent to discriminate is the litmus test for unconstitutionality. So the Supreme Court essentially said that in order for a disenfranchisement law to become unconstitutional, there has to be 
you have to prove that there was intent to discriminate. So there are um, challenges that could be brought and challenges that we, um, a lot of people are still discussing bringing. There is some conversation about bringing an Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment claim. There's discussion about utilizing the First Amendment, the right to free speech. And I think there's also a very interesting Section 2 discussion. So Section 2 prohibits practices and procedures that restrict access to the ballot um, in communities of color. And so the argument is that these laws are also diluting the vote of people of color. And so I think I wouldn't be surprised if someone um, in the next few years, one of those cases is brought and actually makes it pretty far. I think it would be a pretty interesting argument to see how it would play out. And there is um, calls legislatively for change as well. So this issue gained a lot of attention actually in the 2000 presidential election because of kind of two, you know, two related um, felony restriction concerns. The first is that Florida is one of the very few states that no matter what type of felony you commit, um, you are permanently banned from voting for the rest of your life. Whether you're incarcerated, whether you've completed your sentencing, it doesn't matter, you can never vote. So at that time of the election, more than 600,000 citizens were not able to vote because of a felony conviction. Um, and compounded with that, there were thousands of individuals who were improperly labeled as felony, um, as people with felony convictions. And so their names were purged from the voter rolls and they were also not able to vote, um, even though they technically didn't have felony convictions. And so as we kind of all remember, there were less than a couple thousand votes that decided who won Florida. And so this issue kind of gained a lot of traction at that election because it really showed how much of an outcome um, or how important, you know, how much these laws actually could influence the outcome of an election. So we've seen some international pressure as well, as I said, America really truly has the most severe disenfranchisement laws basically in, in the world. Um, there's pressure from the European Court of Human Rights, which has ruled that any blanket limit on vi voting um, limit, sorry, violates the European Convention on Human Rights. And in 2006, the United Nations Human Rights Committee called for the U.S. to restore the right to vote to people um, once they've completed their prison or parole requirements. Um, and we've also seen some state-by-state -state ease restrictions. So recently in Virginia, we have seen the governor there um, pardon or allow people to vote with felony convictions, provided that they're no longer in custody. And we are seeing movement to continue to eliminate some of these restrictions and make it easier for people to access the ballot. And I think that, you know, we're continuing to see attention on these issues again in the presidential election cycle. And I think uh, particularly once the primary kind of winds down um, and we're watching everything play out, I think we'll continue to see, I'm hoping we'll continue to see attention brought to this issue. So as I mentioned, disenfranchisement laws um, vary state to state. There's no federal law that restricts someone's right to vote because of a felony conviction. And so any restrictions that are imposed on folks, it's imposed by their state legislature, their state government. So there's two states and only two states that do not impose any felony or any voting restrictions on people for, with felony convictions, and that's Maine and Vermont. And we also see on the opposite side of the spectrum, three states that permanently ban people from voting if they have a felony conviction, regardless of their felony conviction. So those are the three states in red. And the vast majority of states are somewhere in between, although arguably there are, so the states in um, orange, for certain types of felony convictions, individuals cannot vote. Um, but it's not a blanket ban on any felony conviction, so the restriction um, is permanent bans for certain, certain types of felony convictions, but not all of them. And the orange states also impose um, some additional requirements, so even let's say you don't have the permanent ban on voting because of the particular type of felony conviction you have, you might have to go through other 
hoops and ladders to get um, your way to build back, such as paying certain fines and fees or, um, you know, uh, submitting affirmative documentation and getting approval from the governor of the government. The yellow states are states where people can vote once they've completed their sentence. Um, so if they have parole, prison requirements, or community custody requirements, they can vote once all of that is completed. And that's where Washington lies. Um, I guess it's kind of like orange, but yellow nonetheless is what, the, <laughs> what our legend tells us. The dark blue states are states where people who are in prison or on parole cannot vote, but everyone else can. And the light blue states are states where people in prison can't vote, but everyone else can. And so it really does kind of go on this spectrum um, and vary state to state, even in states that are right next to each other. You might be able to vote in Indiana, but not ever in Kentucky. So in Washington State, um, which is, you know, kind of what I really want to focus on today, what the law in the state of Washington is, <coughs> um, changed in 2009. Um, so I, just to kind of give some context of why the law changed and what it was before, I think can be helpful partially because a lot of the information we hear is people having still the concept of what the old law was. And so it can often be helpful to know, you know, how it changed in order to be understanding where people are coming from or why they might have these um, misconceptions or misinformation. So prior to 2009, Washington was actually one of the most regressive states in the U.S. when it came to disenfranchisement. And we were number 12 um, out of 50 with regards to the percentage of individuals who were disenfranchised because of a felony conviction. And this number resulted in over 160,000 people ineligible to vote. Um, and I should clarify, it was 3.6% of the voting age population, so people that are over 18 um, and ineligible to vote. And this was largely a result, again, like I said earlier, many people were not necessarily even in jail or prison anymore, but were instead um, unable to complete the requirements that were in place in order to get your voting rights back. And so this meant that just over a quarter of people who had criminal convictions were actually able to get their voting rights restored. So the law prior to 2009 um, and why people were so, why so few people were able to get their rights restored was because the law was very restrictive um, and often very confusing for folks. So prior to 2009, people had to pay all of their court fines and fees, also referred to as legal financial obligations. They also had to complete all terms of their sentencing. So if someone had to go to therapy or they had to um, do community service or a treatment program, they had to do all of that before they were able to vote. People also had to affirmatively draft papers and documentation, which was filed with the court or state board, and get approved, um, have those documentation documents approved before getting their right to vote back. And as you can imagine, this resulted in a lot of confusion and misinformation. Um, it was also really expensive um, for, for the government to be going through this process for every person that wanted to get the right to vote back. And for people who have the right to vote um, and are, you know, trying to re-enter into society, their path to re-entry was really impeded. Um, there's a lot of statistics that show that people that have a felony conviction um, that are able to more re successfully reintegrate back into society are more successful generally, and they're also less likely to commit another crime. And so this was really kind of another roadblock in that successful reentry process for people. So today, the, in recognizing kind of all of those issues, the Washington legislature in 2009 passed the Washington Voting Rights, Re Rights Restoration Act. And I'm going to probably refer to it as the VRR for saving my uh, tongue a little bit. But this was really an attempt to streamline the process for people to get their right to vote back and encourage civic participation. 
So it's a really exciting law. It's doing a lot of great things, um, you know, but the problem is getting people to know that they have the right to vote back. So since 2009, the Washington law provides for automatic restoration of voting rights of people with felony convictions. And as a result of this law, more than 150,000 people became eligible to vote, which was very exciting. So like I said, unfortunately, many people are not aware of when or how they get their voting rights restored. Um, and so this is where all of you come in and where, where we're trying to reach people today too. So there were three sort of major changes to the law in 2009. And the first is automatic restoration, and the second has to do with LFOs. And we'll talk about those in turn in just a second. But I think the first thing that's really important to note is that people only lose the right to vote if they have an adult felony conviction. So misdemeanors do not disenfranchise, juvenile convictions do not disenfranchise. Only convictions for an adult, only felony, adult felony convictions result in the loss of the right to vote. And so this is the case regardless of supervision status. So someone, even someone is incarcerated um, for a misdemeanor, for example, or awaiting a trial, their right to vote is not been lost yet. Unless, of course, they also have a felony conviction. But. So like I said, there were kind of three major changes to the 2009 law. The first was the automatic restoration um, required, or the automatic restoration the second was that you are no longer required to pay off all of your LFOs in order to vote. And the third is that only certain types of supervision impact your voting eligibility. So we'll talk about a little bit more in depth about each of these. So since 2009, and it's still the case today, someone that has a felony conviction has the right to vote automatically restored. And I have said this you know, probably 20 times, but I'm going to keep saying it because I think it's a really important point that people really um, need that need to know that they don't have to do anything to get that right to vote back. So if you have a Washington State conviction, this automatic restoration occurs as soon as you're no longer under the authority of the DOC. And what this means is that as soon as you have completed any required jail or prison sentence, as well as any required community custody, your right to vote is restored. Um, if people have questions about whether they're on community custody or not, they can definitely call and check with the DOC. And they really should if they have any questions, just to make sure that their right to vote is restored. Um, but if someone has an out-of-state or a federal conviction, their right to vote is automatically restored as soon as they're no longer incarcerated. And so even if they have other supervisory requirements, their right to vote is still restored, is provided that they're a Washington resident, otherwise eligible. Um, but as soon as they're out of um, jail or prison, their right to vote is back. And so just to reiterate one more time, automatic restoration means that you do not need to file a certificate of discharge or any other affirmative documentation to get your right to vote back. So the second major change to the two, in the 2009 law was that it eliminated the requirement for people to pay their LFOs, or the legal financial obligations. And the payment of legal financial obligations, or the requirement to pay these LFOs, was the single biggest roadblock for people to get their right to vote back. <coughs> Excuse me. So the overwhelming number of criminal defendants, as many of you probably are aware, are indigent. And so the vast majority of people were not able to pay their legal financial obligations off and thereby were not able to vote. So now, under the 2009 law, everyone, like everyone else in society who owes debts, an individual with a felony conviction's right to vote is no longer contingent on his or her socioeconomic status and ability to pay debts. So this is a very exciting component of the 2009 law, but again, it's something that people are getting a lot of um, kind of confusing information about, and so we really want to reiterate, again, if you have LFOs, you can still vote. There is a provision in the 2009 law that allows a court to revoke someone's right to vote if they don't pay all of their court fines and fees, a certain number of them, 
However, this is an affirmative step that a court has to take. And so an individual will be notified of this process, and they will be told that someone is attempting to take their right to vote back, or revoke their right to vote. Um, and I would say, if you hear of that ever happening, we have, we have yet to, but if someone does hear of that happening, we would love to hear about that at the ACLU and talk to that person. Um, and so if someone is experiencing any sort of problem with voting because of legal financial obligations, I really would encourage them to talk to someone here. So kind of in sum, most individuals are automatically eligible to register to vote. Um, no questions asked. So on the left-hand side, we see people who can vote, and that's anyone with a federal or state conviction once they are no longer incarcerated, or as we said, people who have a juvenile offense or misdemeanor offense because they never even lost their right to vote. The only people who are maybes are, of course, people who are still incarcerated, um, don't get the right to vote back until that's completed. And then if someone is on some current level of DOC supervision, they should make sure they're not on community custody before they can get their right to vote. Um, so the first big thing is, yes, you have your right to vote automatically restored, but you still need to register. Um, and this is the case even if you voted or were registered to vote before your felony conviction, even if you voted in every single election before your felony conviction, 99.9% um, .9 of people still need to register. And so if someone has any questions about their status, they can definitely check with the Secretary of State or the Elections Department to make sure. But certainly, for the most part, people need to re-register. Um, so you can re-register online in, via mail or in person. And there are certain deadlines for registration that people should be aware of. Um, they're not super stringent, but just it's helpful to know if people are getting released, for example, from custody right before an election, um, they can, it's better than perhaps for them to register in person because the deadline is closer to the ballot um, deadline. There's two things that I, are important to keep in mind um, with perhaps clients that we're working with. The first um, is that, again, if there's any question whatsoever about someone's um, DOC community custody status, they really should make sure that they check that with the DOC before registering to vote because it is a felony to vote if not legally eligible. So we definitely don't want folks getting in trouble. Um, as excited as we are about people voting and accessing their right to the ballot if they're eligible, we definitely don't want people who are ineligible to, you know, get penalized for that. And a second issue um, that I just want to flag for people, especially if you're working with people in, in registration processes, is if someone has a pending citizenship application, um, again, only citizens technically can vote. Um, and so if you register to vote before your citizen application is complete um, or, or approved, it can actually delay your application or otherwise penalize your application. And so advise clients to wait to register to vote for, um, until that citizen application has been approved. So another question that comes up a lot with registration, um, particularly with many of the people that we work with, is um, you do not need a home or stable address to vote. And so it's actually not, um, it should not be that burdensome for someone who is homeless to access the ballot. And there's, so when you register to vote, there's two addresses you have to provide. The first is a residential address. And this can just be a name of a shelter or a park or even an intersection. It's just used to determine where this person considers home so that they can determine where their voting precinct is, um, which thereby is, you know, who is your representative, what are the issues you can vote on on the ballot, those types of things. The second address you need to provide when you attempt to register is um, a mailing address. And so this can include, you know, similar addresses to above. It's just basically anywhere that you can receive mail. It can even be general delivery at a post office. And so this is just where all of your election-related materials will be sent, including the ballot. So it needs to just be somewhere that you can actually pick up. Mail can be delivered and that you can actually pick it up there and access it. 
Another common kind of question or issue we hear a lot about is ID questions or ID requirements. And you do not need a Washington State driver's license or other photo ID in order to vote. You do if you want to do so online. Um, but if you want to register or can register via mail or in person, you can submit a number of alternative forms or documentation. And so we have a, a bunch listed there. And basically, these forms of ID just have to be provided before casting a ballot to the elections department in your county. Um, and so I have been told by a number of elections departments that they notify people that register, or they should be notifying people that register to vote without an ID um, of what they need to do in order to have their ballot count. And so people should get individualized information about this process via mail, I think a number of notifications should be sent to them, but just in case it can be helpful in case they change their mailing address or whatnot to just remind them to turn something in before they cast their ballot to make sure that it's counted. And sort of the last big um, thing with when it comes to voting and access to voting is accessibility. So if someone is, while Washington is a mail only state, there are drop boxes in every county that people can drop their ballot off and they don't have to pay for a stamp. There are also um, accessible ballots and accessible voting locations for people that have a disability or otherwise need accommodations or assistance. And if there's ever an opportunity to vote, or sorry, if there's ever an impediment to voting um, and you need additional accommodations or your client needs additional accommodations or assistance, they're able to request so through the elections department. And friends or relatives can also assist in, um, in these you know, processes as long as if they're helping to cast the ballot for the individual, or fill out the ballot, I should say, the vote will cast the voter's choice, right, not the person helping them out. So that is all that I have material-wise, um, but I would love to open it up for people that have any questions. Um, you can pose your question in a number of ways. You can send me an email, my email is uh, up there. Um, you can put it in the chat function, in the chat box, um, and I will just give everyone a few minutes to type that in, um, whether it's via email or chat. If neither are working for you, you can also unmute your microphone, and I'll give an opportunity for that as well. If you want to explain or otherwise just voice your question, we can definitely do that. Um, so I'll just give everyone a second to kind of collect their thoughts, and I will open up the questioning.